all the way back in 2019, I was sent to this ABIT BP6, a dual socket 370 motherboard. I was also given a warning about it that the capacitors may likely need to be replaced, so I ended up shelving it until I got around to that. Well, three years have gone by since then, but since I recently launched CapsWiki, there isn't a better time for me to get around to this. So today, we're going to finally get around to recapping and preliminarily testing the ABIT BP6. <laughs> First, let's go over what this board is, because it is both famous and infamous. Dual socket 370 chips like this are not officially supported by Intel. Intel did design CPUs for servers and workstations to be usable in SMP, or symmetric multiprocessing, configurations, but hobbyist level boards like this weren't a part of their plan. The BP6 from ABIT is an OEM hack to make Celerons work like this, which didn't have SMP locked out. Later boards were able to get Pentium 3s working like this, which was a little bit more complicated, but the BP6 was the first board to bring SMP to hobbyists. There weren't many operating system options to support this at the time, and Windows 2000 was one of the main ways to support both CPUs in this board due to using the NT kernel. It can be used with DOS-based OSs like Windows 98, but will only use a single CPU. Still though, this revolutionary feature cemented this board's legendary status. But time started to make it turn from hero to villain. One of the biggest features that separated the BP6 from server and workstation boards was its overclocking capabilities. Overclocking two CPUs that weren't made to do it could lead to understandably unstable results. But as time went by, people started noticing that BP6s were becoming increasingly unstable. The culprit was eventually identified. The capacitors. ABIT had used cheap TAYA brand capacitors that were one of the first to usher in the capacitor plague. These capacitors were so bad that ABIT was RMAing boards beyond their original one-year warranty to replace them. Though, you wouldn't get much better capacitors back from them. So, without intervention, pretty much every ABIT BP6 was doomed to fail sooner rather than later. This led to groups that used these boards to start sharing information about them to keep them going. There are still the BP6.com and Bad Caps forums up with information from people who had their boards going bad during this time. Capacitor replacement information was circulated, so those who were willing to try and fix it themselves could do so. This leads me to the board I have, which is now 23 years old. Mine still somehow had the original capacitors on it, which I'm guessing means it hasn't been used in a long time. But I wanted to get it working again, and share how I did it on CapsWiki so others may do the same. When I write pages on CapsWiki, I try to find out as much as I can about the original parts, so the most compatible parts can be found for the replacements. Due to the popularity of this board, I am nowhere near the first to sleuth around for information on the Taya caps, which is probably a good thing, because the data sheets have been archived and may have been lost like many others I've tried to look for have been. Some of the capacitors on the motherboard are mostly standard grade, for just bulking up power in places where it may be needed. But the green-sleeved ones near the CPUs were special, being low ESR due to the near instantaneous power draws CPUs can have. The original capacitors made extremely bold claims about their ESR specs, so much so that when I went to find replacements, there were none that matched. This isn't just a fabrication on the part of Taya, though. Manufacturing practices for devices have changed over the years. The BP6 used traditional aluminum electrolytic capacitors, as was standard at the time. These were available in high-performance variants like these from many manufacturers. But for a long time now, polymer capacitors have taken their place. The specialty versions of the electrolytic caps didn't really have any other market, and as a result, they just aren't made anymore. We should consider ourselves lucky that for most repairs it is still possible to find compatible parts, but we're going to start finding more edge cases like this over time where it will become increasingly difficult to find new parts. Back to my board though, I still needed caps, so I decided to try and find some polymers that I could make work. Unfortunately, there are slim pickings for drop-in replacements because at the same time the industry shifted from through-hole to SMD packaging, but I found one single compatible part that would fit. 
It's an okay brand, Kemet, and exceeds all of the original performance standards, which isn't too surprising being polymer. The other caps were much easier to pick out since they were all more standard, so I got those chosen and had my final capacitor list. There is a reported upgrade to make by replacing one of the capacitors with an all-around larger one, but I decided not to try that this time around as I was looking more for original replacements rather than to start modifying the board. With the parts on hand after ordering, it was just a matter of putting them in. I decided to do this on a stream on Twitch. I haven't repaired a motherboard this new, but I've worked on plenty of other things that I was confident in my methods. I haven't made the plunge on a vacuum soldering iron yet, so I still use a solder pump. The key to using one of those without risking damaging the traces is to build up a muscle memory to immediately pull the iron melting the solder away from the pump before you suck up the solder. As you get the timing down, it becomes easier and is a perfectly adequate solution for this. I did run into a few issues, though. Some of the capacitors had weird footprints with two mounting holes intersecting each other. This made it difficult to get all of the solder out. Additionally, all of the legs that went directly into copper pores had no thermal relief whatsoever, making it take considerably longer to properly melt the solder to get it all out. This was really annoying for the rework process, but in theory may help dissipate more heat from the capacitors while in use. But putting any fan near the board will help even more than that. Reinstalling the capacitors was fine, though. For some reason, I had this memory of something like this motherboard having the polarity markings reversed on the silkscreen, so I was a little more paranoid than usual about matching the way the new ones were installed. All the markings were correct in the end, which makes me wonder what I was remembering now. A more difficult part of the process was putting in my alternative polymer caps. Picking caps can be a pain because you have to match so many electrical specifications, but also physical ones. Since these were the only ones I could find that matched the electrical specs, I had to concede on them not being an exact fit in this board. They were close, but slightly larger diameter, which was a bit of a shame because they are much shorter, which would have made cooler compatibility better instead of worse, like here. It was also pointed out to me by chat that these larger diameter parts were getting worryingly close to some of the exposed through-hole components that could be shorted. So just to be safe, I put some polyamide tape over them before the final installation. I had not previously tested this board, because I didn't want to risk damage to the components on it with known untrustworthy capacitors on it. So after replacing the caps, it was my first time ever to power it up. I was sent the board with some Celeron CPUs and had a few others on hand, so I was able to get it up and running, but I didn't really have any great cooler options for it. So I grabbed one off of a Socket 7 motherboard to keep it somewhat cool just for this first test. So I popped in a Celeron 466, 128 megabytes of SD RAM, and a PCI VGA card, and I just got some beeps. Power is going to it, and... Beep. I like one beep. I would like some more anything. This is an AGP capable board though, so I knew it was possible it would only use that for video. So I went and found an AGP card instead, and... So let's try this. That fan sucks. Beep. Boom! Yes! We did it! It works! Ha! Oh, yeah! Alright, that is a recapped ABIT BP6 dual processor motherboard. Okay, this is actually the next day. Um, I ran out of recording space on all my drives, but uh, I was pushed to try dual processor in this because apparently you can put two different frequency chips in there and i think it runs them both at the same i'm not 100 sure but uh since i did have three chips here and all of them were under the clock speed limit of uh the current bios i can actually do this so this i believe is a 433 and uh i actually did this yesterday with this one, which I think is a 366. 
uh, which I was super not comfortable with because it, it well, you'll see. <laughs> if I put that in there, it will turn on here. Two processors detected, but it does report it at 466. So I'm not sure if it's overclocking the lower speed one, or maybe it's just reporting the speed of the faster one. I don't really know. So I don't want to run this uh, too long and potentially roast that CPU. So uh, <laughs> demonstrates it works as a dual processor board. That's so cool. Uh, so <laughs> that's a Celeron based socket 370 dual processor board working. Whoa, <laughs> that's just kind of awesome. Now, the, of course, the question is, you know, what do you do with this? Because obviously Windows 98 DOS based kernel does not support this. Um, you can run one moment. NT based uh, operating systems like Windows NT Workstation 4.0 here, which has just the best startup sound ever. Go look it up. Oh, yes. Um, so this would be an ideal operating system to run on here because this actually supports multiple processors, one of the new technologies in the NT kernel. So that's one way you could go. I have a different plan in mind, but that will be for a future video when you will actually see this next. For now, since I know this actually works, <laughs> I was able to go ahead and order some processors. I purchased some SL3PZs, I believe it might be FZs, I don't remember which, they're basically the same and there's like way more of one on eBay than the other. Uh, 533 megahertz processors, so I should be able to basically max this thing out. Now I know Celeron 300As overclock really well, and uh, it might be the same processor or slightly different. 366 megahertz Celerons also overclock well on this. My goal is not really to overclock this thing. Um, it's more to demonstrate a enthusiast grade workstation type board this isn't really meant to be a workstation system it's meant to be like a hey what if we did something crazy <laughs> type system so that's how i plan on using it i'm still working out coolers that's part of why i don't want to run this right now is these coolers are not super ideal so yeah that's the plan but it works and i'm really excited about what i'm going to do with this build uh because it's going to be pretty awesome <laughs> Trust me, you're gonna like it. So that is it for now. The next time you see this will be when I do the build. But yeah, it should come out pretty well now. So if you enjoyed this video, you may want to subscribe because this thing will be coming back in its own dedicated build. And if you want to help support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. And I will see you next time.